All right, so we're going to start working in chapter nine. Now chapter nine is all about confidence intervals. So we're gonna learn about confidence intervals and what they are and how they work. Um, if you've ever heard of the words margin of error, we're gonna do that and figure out what that is. Um, and then chapter 10, we're gonna do um, something called hypothesis testing. Chapter 11, we actually do both, both confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Namely, chapter nine is really the beginning, the launching off point, if you will, of inferential statistics. We're finally doing it. We've laid all the groundwork from chapters, well, honestly, one through eight has all been groundwork leading up to this point. So chapters one, and um, we learned a lot of definitions. Chapter two, we learned descriptive statistics. Chapter three, same thing. Um, chapter four is bivariate statistics, but it's all descriptive still. Five, six, seven, eight, those are all probability. How does probability work? How does um, binomial probability work? How does normal probability work? And then how does it change if you're working with samples versus working with individuals? And that in a nutshell is what we've covered. So now we're going to start taking those samples that we know how to find with nice random sampling and unbiased and all that stuff from chapter one, and we're going to infer from there about the larger population. Now the first thing we want to talk about is proportions. Now we've dealt with proportions in a couple different ways. Um, in particular, you want to think about chapter eight, eight two in particular, um, and 6-2, the binomial distribution, and 6-1 to some extent as well, but 6-2 in particular. This is how proportions work for us. Uh, namely, it's something that um, is discrete. So you're going to call up, you know, I don't know, you want to call a thousand people and find out what percentage of them are going to vote for Obama in the upcoming election. What you're looking for is a percentage, a proportion of the population. I mean, you're not really interested in the percentage of people that call that you called. You're really interested in the percentage of people overall in all of Michigan or all of the U.S. or whatever. So you want to be able to obtain a point estimate, a single value that you think it's going to be, and then you want to be able to build an interval from there. At least that's our objective. All right, so what's a point estimate? A point estimate is the value of a statistic that estimates the value of the parameter. Remember we talked about that in chapter, I'll put it, I'm going to scroll right down here. Chapters one and three, we learned that populations have parameters and samples have statistics. So for example, um, we don't know what proportion, um, this is ahead of the election if you'll bear with me, we don't know what proportion of people are going to vote for Obama at the election. That would be a parameter. It's everybody, all the voters, what percentage of them are going to go for Obama Obama, or, or Romney, whatever. Um, and then we don't get that. We don't get everybody. What we do is we get a sample of people. So we call up 1,000 people, 600 people, 800 people, whatever. So we call them up and say, hey, who are you going to vote for? And we assume that the population works like your sample works. And for the most part, that's actually a pretty fair assumption, to be honest. Those polls are usually pretty accurate. Um, supposing that nothing big happens in between. All right, so in this chapter, we're going to use the sample statistics to create ranges, i.e. intervals, for the unknown population parameter. We don't get to know what the population parameter is. We just make a range for it. All right, now, before we get into that, let's talk about our lovely beads. Do you remember our beads? Hold on, let me pull up my website. Here it is. So we had down here the images. We had this box full of beads in my office, right? And then I said, pretend you take a scoop out. So, so I gotta get back to the notes. Hold on one second. There they are. Okay, so what parameter are you trying to estimate? So you're trying to figure out when we were looking at that problem, we were trying to figure out what proportion of the um, scoops, sorry, the scoops were red, right? So what proportion of red? And you can remember, just when I talked about this in chapter eight, I said, look, this is really a metaphor. Suppose, I don't know, the red were the ones that are gonna vote for Obama and the white are the ones that are gonna vote for Romney or something like that, right? So it's, it, it's a metaphor for this. Like this is all the population in this box and then you take a scoop out, i.e. you call a sample of people and ask them, right? That's how it works. Okay, so back here. We wanted to figure out the proportion. Since it's proportion, the symbol for that is a little lowercase p, which is actually the same p that you were working with more or less in 6.2, the binomial distribution. All right, now what was the total number of beans in our sample? So up here I said we got 30 red beans and 90 white beans in a sample in our scoop. That means that we had 120 total, because if there's 30 red and 90 white in your scoop, that's what you get. And then what was the total number of reds in our sample? That was 30. It says it right here, 30. 
So what's our best guess for what the proportion of red beads in this box is? That would be p hat, which is equal to x over n. That's a formula we learned before in um, chapter 8, section 8.2, actually. So it's 30 over 120, which is equal to 0.25. Now, do you actually expect this to be exactly 0.25? Well, no, right? But it should be close, right? Assuming that we chose our sample in a nice, unbiased way. Maybe we blindfolded ourselves. Who knows, right? But assuming we took a good sample, it shouldn't be exactly the same, right? It's not going to be 0.25, oh, 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 oh. But it would be close to it. Maybe it's like 0 0.24051396, right? Or maybe it's 0.23415, right? So there's more decimal places there. So we don't actually expect it to be exactly 0.25, but we expect it to be very close to 0.25. All right, so we don't know the proportion in the entire box. We don't get to know that. That's the parameter, right? The population proportion. What proportion of this whole box is red? We don't get to know that. What we get to know is what proportion of our scoop is red, right? Our sample, that's the statistic, right? P hat, which for us was 0.25. So P hat was 0.25, then we assume that the box is close to 0.25. Ah, now how close is close? That's kind of what chapter 9 is all about. So what you do is you build an interval. You take your point estimate and you plus or minus something called a margin of error. So you say, okay, look, I think it's 25% give or take error. Right? Now how we calculate the error, we'll worry about that a little bit later. But suffice to say right now that I, a statistician myself, would say we estimate 25% of the beans in the box are red plus or minus 7.7 .7 percentage points. And we say that we're 95 percent confident. And again, we'll figure out where they get these numbers later. So these numbers come from somewhere. We'll talk about that. But for right now, let's just figure out what they're saying. Okay. So we said p hat was 0.25. That's where they get the 25 percent from. Now the error they tell us is 7.7 .7 percentage points. So that's really 0 0.077 right here. So what's the confidence interval they're really stating? So they're not they're not saying it's exactly 25%. They're saying, look, it's 25% give or take plus or minus. So you take 25% plus or minus 7.7%. .7%, that'll give it to you as a percentage. Or you could write it as a decimal, which to be honest with you is what we deal with more often. So you take 0.25 minus 0 0.077. You turn them both into decimals. And then it gives you the same numbers. It's just the one on the left is percentage symbols, and the one on the right is decimals. I don't care which you use, but you want to be clear about it. Um, honestly, we use the one on the right the vast, vast majority of the time. Okay, But CNN and other um, news organizations use the one on the left for whatever reason. Because it's honestly because 7.7% 7 .7 is easier for people to understand than 0 0.077. Okay, so let's draw a picture of this interval and label. So I had a number line here in the notes. So what you need to do is you need to put p hat down the center. So p hat was 0.25, which is 25%. So this is 15 over here, 35 over here. So you count 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and so on. And you get right here to 25. That's your point estimate, p hat. Okay, now it said to label the point estimate, done. That's the middle and label your error. Okay, well error is the distance between that center and those edges. The right hand edge was 32.7 percent, the left hand edge was 17.3 percent. Okay, so the error is the distance in between. So you'd say, okay, from this center line to that far right line, that's 7.7 .7 percent, or from the center line over to the left hand line, that's 7.7 .7 percent. All right, now what is the relationship between the margin of error and the width? All right, so the margin of error is this purple distance right here. It is literally a distance. It's always positive. You'd say, okay, from here to here, 7.7%. .7%. So the width of the interval altogether is this orange line, right, from all the way down here at the left to all the way up here at the right. So that error is equal to twice, or excuse me, the, the width is equal to twice the error. And I have it right here. So width is equal to, oops, there we go. Width is equal to 2 times the error, which is equal to um, 2 times 0 0.077, which is 15.4%. Okay? 
All right, so the larger your margin of error, let's just think about this, the larger the error, the larger this purple line is, then the wider the orange one's going to be, right? Because if those purple ones get stretched out farther, then the orange also will get stretched out further. So the larger your error, the wider your interval. The smaller your error, the narrower your interval is going to be. All right. Now, we know now what the error looks like, right? So that's that's what they're talking about when they say margin of error what they're saying is what's your wiggle room right what's your give or take okay it's a little bit more refined than the give or take of the standard deviation it's really standard deviation combined with some other things right but now they also talked about confidence they said oh we're 95 percent confident because remember it's statistics we're never 100 percent certain of anything right it's always possible that we're way off and I don't know it's 10 percent in that box Okay, so the level of confidence represents the expected proportion of intervals that will contain the parameter if a large number of different samples is obtained. So, for example, if I have a confidence level of 95%, which I did in this above interval, it said it right here, 95% confidence, which honestly is the one they use the most often in the news and stuff like that. What that's saying is like, look, if I take one scoop after another scoop after another scoop after another scoop, and every time I take a scoop, I make a new interval. So one time it was 25%, the next time it's 24%, the next time it's 28%, the next time it's 20%, and so on. So you keep taking scoop after scoop after scoop, and you make an interval, 95% of those intervals will have whatever the true proportion is in it and 5% of a won't right so they told us the confidence level was 95% which is 0.95 so what's alpha now you can see from up here that alpha so let me put it this way 1 minus alpha is equal to your confidence so alpha is equal to if you will the complement of your confidence remember complements from chapter 5 the probability chapter so you take your confidence away from 1 and you'll have it so you'd say okay alpha is equal to let me put it this way. Alpha is equal to 1 minus oops, 0 0.95, which is equal to 0 0.05. That's your alpha. Like that. OK, what would happen to this interval if we kept the data from our original scoop, but we wanted to raise our confidence level? OK, follow that. We're going to keep our scoop. Didn't change our scoop, but we want to be more certain. So you want to make it bigger, right? If you want to be more confident and you can't change the size of your sample, you're not allowed to take a bigger scoop, then all you have to do is make a bigger interval. Right? If you want to be more sure, certain you're catching the magic mew, right? P or, you know, fish, whatever, then fish with a bigger net. I mean, if there's like some magical, you know, true proportion out there, the real proportion of red beads in that box, then all you need is to make, to make a bigger scoop net and you'll know that you've got it you know say oh okay I'm 99 percent certain it's between 15 and 35 that the problem with that is that you can make your interval so large that it's useless like I am 99.99999 percent confident that's between 10 percent and 80 percent of red beads in this box it's between 10 and 80 percent I'm I'm like almost 100 percent certain but you've made it so large an interval that it's totally useless right so you can make a bigger interval with the same size scoop, but the problem with that is you can make intervals so big that they're unwieldy and not useful. Okay, so you gotta play that game. I mean, as a statistician, you have to make a choice. You say, okay, I want this much confidence and I want this much error, right? Okay, so, but the upshot of it is that if you wanna be more confident, you can do one of a couple things. One of the things you can do is just make a bigger interval. If you make a bigger interval, you'll have more confidence. If you raise your confidence, you'll be making a bigger interval, provided you don't change anything else, like N or you know X or anything like that. 